Uh, I kind of wish you would have said more. <laughs> that may be the nicest thing Carl's ever said about me. I just want you to know that. <clears throat> I'd like to run it back for a second. Uh, just want to thank you. I think it was a kind way of saying I've been around a long time. <clears throat> I do so appreciate the friendships. It's been good already uh, greeting old friends and already making new friends, meeting new friends at this time. And uh, it is a good system of checks and balances to let the guy introduce uh, the next guy, which is good. But it's good to be together, isn't it? It's really good. And uh, it's good to see so many friends. It's good to see Lindy Way uh, with us. From Nampula. I just want to say, when, when, uh, when you travel to Mozambique and you arrive at Nampula and you, you just want to see one face, and it's Lindy Way. <laughs> you, you just want to see her coming in. And there's such a calm that takes place when she, when she arrives. It's true. It's true. I mean, Scott would be great to see, but Lindy Way is who you really want to see when, when you arrive there and you're trying to get through customs. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, we had such an excellent time in Mozambique, such an excellent time. It's so wonderful to be part of a global family of churches, Carl was talking about. So excellent to see that we get to play a part in what God's doing around the nations and in the nations. And know uh, there's a give and take. We're learning and we're growing and we're also playing a part. So uh, that's exciting. Carl did ask me to speak and he asked me to speak uh, when he did, he said the theme was multiplication. And when I hear the word multiplication, I immediately begin to think making disciples, planting churches, taking new ground. And I also begin to think what a fierce battle that is. Like I just immediately when that word, in fact, sometimes when I hear that word, I get something in my gut that rises up. It's like, man, there's going to be a battle. That makes sense to anyone? Yeah. Man, it does to me. So uh, I was thinking about that. I thought about how important vision is in taking new ground and multiplication. And uh, as I was preparing, I was just led to 1 Samuel. And so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, how vision is crucial for multiplication. For kingdom advancement, for what God has called us to as a family together, vision is crucial. And uh, I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 11. If you have your Bible, you'd like to turn. I think the words will be on the screen. But a few years ago, several years ago, one of our elders, Jay Steen, Dr. James Dean, uh, he began to, he's so uh, in love with the Word of God, he began to ask us to stand when we read the Word of God. And I know that there are many churches that do that, but it just is, it just did something in us. And, and we've been doing that ever since. So if you're able to, would you stand as we read 1 Samuel 11? I'll read uh, the first 11 or 12 verses or so. Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I'll make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there's no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, they reported the matter in the ears of the people, and all the people wept aloud. Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel, by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. When he mustered them at Bezek, the people of Israel 
were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, Thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. And the next day Saul put the people in three companies. And they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Father, we just pause at the beginning of our time together, just thinking, listening, worshiping, waiting before you. Lord, we just confess we thank you for your presence and we need your help. Lord, we love your word that it's alive and Lord, we love to be in your presence. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We know you're here. We say, would you come? Jesus, we thank you that you're our friend, our savior, our advocate. And we pray this in your authority. Amen. You can be seated. All right, a bit of the context. And it's interesting, if you've been listening to the prophetic words, I thought, wow, they're preaching my message about feeling trapped and waiting and a and a phone call, setting free about God uh, breaking chains and things like that. So here's the context. Nahash and his army had besieged. That word means surrounded, Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead is an Israelite town. And they had surrounded them. Besieged means surrounded. And the threat was very real. Like there was a real enemy, and there was real danger. There was imminent danger. And the men of Jabesh Gilead knew that uh, they were about to be torn, killed, plundered. And so the context is they decided, they melted in fear. Actually, the men of Jabesh Gilead melted in fear. And they said, we're going to go make a treaty with Nahash. And so that's what they began to do. And Nahash says, sure, I'll make a treaty with you on one condition that I'll gouge out all the right eyes. I'll gouge out all the right eyes of the men and so thus bringing disgrace on Israel and essentially making them ineffective. He's saying, I want to take your vision. And the main point tonight, I really feel, is this. Don't make a treaty with the enemy. And I may say that 10 times tonight, and it comes from, uh, I'll explain as we go along, but my heart, I just... It's don't make a treaty with the enemy. See, I want to I explain a little bit about the battle and a soldier in that day. See, a soldier would, in that day, they would hold the, the, the shield with their left hand. And the shield would cover up their left eye and they would look with their right eye. And they would have their sword or their spear. And it's with their right eye that they would find the enemy. It's with their right eye that they would judge depth perception. And it's with their right eye that they would be able to inflict damage. And so in effect, Nahash was saying, I'm going to render you harmless. You can have peace with me. You can have peace with the enemy as long as you'll lose your vision. As long as you'll lose your vision. That's Nahash wanted the men of Jabesh Gilead harmless. He wanted them ineffective in battle. And I think we have a picture of a soldier. And uh, just thinking, that's the picture of how they might have looked in that day. The question I have for us this, this evening is, have you ever been surrounded by the enemy? I grew up uh, around Carl. He says, this means yes, this means no. Um, Have you ever been surrounded by the enemy? Maybe that's your case right now. It's really scary. It really is. There's really danger. There's real things that are happening. There's real, and and it's a natural, this, this encounter explains to us the natural human response that we will stop at no ends just to have peace. There's a natural human, to have some assemblance of peace Like, the natural human response is like stop at nothing, to have just a a kind of an assemblance of peace. Just want to remind us, don't make a treaty with the enemy. Don't lose your vision. There's so many Christian 
families that I've encountered that have, in order to have peace with this world or peace with the enemy, they've lost their vision. I think there's a lot of Christian young people who, in, in order to have peace with this life, peace, with, peace in this life, they've forfeited their vision and they've become harmless. I mean, it's a sad, I know this sound, I'm, I, want, I like to tell jokes and make people laugh, but this isn't maybe one of those messages. Uh, I just felt it's about vision. I, I think I meet too many, it's too common for Christian re- retirees in order to protect their and guard their pension and their time, in order to have peace with their finance and their time, they forfeit their vision for kingdom advancement and for multiplication. And they've made a choice. I want peace and you can gouge out my my right eye. Teenagers, I was thinking about the choice it is to Think, I just want peace. I just want to be accepted in that friend group. So you throw away your vision for the kingdom, for just that that chance to be accepted. Peace in this life. You throw away your vision to make a difference and make your life count. See multiplication and disciples made and kingdom advancement. Anybody happy yet? Don't make a treaty with the enemy. There was a time in the life of our church at Lifehouse when uh, we were surrounded by the enemy. It was real. There were uh, false things being spread. There was a real enemy. We had uh, a very few. We, we were just a bit larger than a small group. And we'd been going for a while. I mean, we'd managed to grow the church from about 150 to 35. <clears throat> And we were surrounded by the enemy. And I remember, it's like we had no money. All we had was a vision. I remember the day, uh, well, I just, I remember too many of those days. But it seemed as if the only way we were going to get any quality of life was to forfeit our vision and go to something else. Our life before planning a church was pretty posh, I'm going to be honest. Our life before planning a church was pretty posh, and I just uh, was thinking about that, and since planting the church, it was a few years into that, and we were, here we were, surrounded by the enemy. How many of you want to go plant a church at this moment? I just want to add. So... Uh, I, I want to tell you the truth. Vision is crucial. All we had was, we had nothing. We came to a point where we had nothing. And we had a vision to see lives changed by the love of God. We had this vision to see a reproducing, multiplying church. We had a vision to be generous in sending people and finances to bless the nation. We were clear. We had a vision. We just had nothing but that vision. We had no money. We had nothing else. And I remember the day that the banker called. And, and this banker called, I didn't know him, and he called me, and he said, hey, I got your number, and I want to know, do you want to buy this building? And I literally laughed out loud, because we were a very small church, and, uh, and he said, no, no, do you understand what a rent roll, or do you know, have you seen the rent roll? And I'm not going to go into all the details, but just, I said, I don't know what a rent roll is. And he's like, no, it's the people that are paying the rent on this building, do you want to buy it? You used to meet there, we met in the basement. So, uh, Long story short, two weeks later, we were buying a building. We had no idea it was even for sale. It had no for sale sign. God, we had nothing but a vision. And, and I think Simon's prophetic word was a phone call changed. That, and I was thinking, that is my message. A phone call from a banker. We had nothing but a vision. And we went from paying about 4000 a month, this was a long time ago, so that was a lot of money back then, 4000 a month to rent, to instantly when we signed the paperwork, to getting, meeting for free and getting positive cash flow of 3500 a month. 
in a, in a, in a moment. That began to change things. It's at that moment. And then God's allowed, there was a vision and we now, there's a, by God's grace, there's 30,000 square feet on Main Street that is uh, part of Lifehouse. And we, we get, we, we rent that part of it out. And, and I'll just tell you the finance, we get between 16 and $18,000 a month from the rent. And we still use the basement for a really cool youth venue. And we've got a new building beside it. And all that to say, it's not about buildings. It's about tools to see the kingdom advance. And it's about, it's about seeing God move in glory. And literally we had nothing. We had no plan. We just had a vision to see God move. Don't make a treaty with the enemy. The enemy has one condition for peace. It's lose your vision. The enemy, I think, is very happy to have harmless Christians running around. I think he really is. The lure of the peaceful, attractive uh, American dream is enticing, especially when you begin to think about multiplication and the fierce battle that it involves. But I just want to say, making disciples means battle. Multiplying your small group means battle. Multiplying your church means battle. Multiplying yourself means battle. Don't make a treaty with the enemy. That's what, I hope you hear that a bunch. I'll give you some other interesting things about this. The name Nahash in Hebrew, one of the meanings of that name is serpent. And one of the commentators, as I was reading up on this, said this, he said five things. Satan asks for and requires our surrender. Satan wants us to serve him and will attempt to intimidate us into giving in to him. Satan wants to humiliate us and exalt himself over us. Through humiliating one saint, Satan wants to bring reproach on all God's people. Satan wants to take away our ability to effectively fight against him. And Satan wants to make us harmless by taking our vision. Multiplication, making disciples, taking new ground is a fierce battle. We wanted to see a re we want to see a reproducing small group, life group is what we call them, in Columbia, Columbia, Tennessee. And uh, Stanley, who was just up here, he has a nice he had a, a nice job. He's an ER nurse at the hospital, and it's a great job. And he's young, married, and. Uh, one problem is it doesn't allow him to lead a, a small group. The hours are terrible. And so he, he had a decision to make. Am I going to settle? Am I going to lay down? Am I going to allow the enemy to take my vision and just settle for the nice life and a nice income? Or am I going to? And so he started applying for other jobs. He said, no, I really want this. I really want to see. I want to make myself available for the kingdom and, and to be available to make disciples. I'm going to start interviewing. And we found out. He, uh, he, he would call me and say, hey, JP, I got this interview. And I'm like, that's great. And then he would say, hey, JP, they didn't call me back. <laughs> and, uh, and then it would go on and on. And I thought, either he's really bad at interviewing <laughs> or this is a really fierce battle. And so we began to pray as a church. I mean, this is Risa. I'm telling you stuff in the last few weeks. We began to pray as a leadership team. We began to pray as a church. And we didn't, we didn't realize it, but we prayed as a leadership team one night. And the next day, he called and says, hey, I have an interview. He didn't know we were praying. And, and we had a meeting, and we just stopped the meeting to pray for Stan because we felt the Holy Spirit leading. We did battle. And the next day, he had an interview. And guess what? He starts that job the end of this month. He starts that job the end of this month. And it's a job that is... Monday through Friday, I think 6.30 to 2.30 or something, a posh job, whatever. He'll have plenty of time <laughs> for the kingdom. I could go on and on about being around men and women of God that have vision and are not willing to settle for just the American dream. But that's the number one point, I think, from this passage is don't make a treaty with the enemy. Don't allow the enemy to take your vision. Vision for making disciples, vision for reproducing Vision for multiplication. Number two, we guard our vision by reaching out to, to leaders in our life. We guard our vision by reaching out to leaders in our life. I want to read you a bit from verse three. 
The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers throughout all the territory of Israel. Then, if there's no one to save us, we'll give ourselves over to you. And we know, we read the story. Saul hears the people weeping. The Holy Spirit moves upon Saul and he comes and they're rescued. When things were going the worst at Lifehouse, my wife, I'm pretty sure she had quit. She tried to quit, I know that. And uh, the only problem was God wouldn't take her resignation. But, but she was quitting. I just wanted peace. I mean, things were bad. We had nothing. I just wanted peace. I remember going to meet Carl in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, uh, and we met, and, and I was telling him, and I just thinking about my life previous to this, previous to this whole idea about multiplication. And I was thinking about how peaceful my life used to be. And I was thinking about how peaceful it would be to go back to work for the company I was working for and how nice it would be to get a paycheck again and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I was really just uh, whining and uh, I wanted peace. I mean, there's no other way to say it. I was just whining. And Carl asked me a question. I went to meet with him and I asked him, a, or he asked me this question. He's really good at asking questions, by the way. And he said, he listened to all that kind of patiently. And, uh, and he said, I, I have a question. I'm like, I knew you would. And uh, he's like, has God released you from this vision? And I said, I, I wish he would. <laughs> but no, no, he's not. And it was at that moment I knew that I was going to be in a fight with hell. Like literally. I knew I already was, but I knew I just re-upped. You know what I mean? I just signed up for another however many years. Like, I knew that. And I knew my friend. Here's the thing. Here's what, like, we can all understand the men of Jabesh Gilead. It was real fear. They wanted peace. They melted in fear. But this one thing they did. They reached out to people. They reached out to leaders in their life. And, I, and that, that's impacted me. I can, I can sincerely say that I would not be here. Lifehouse Church would not be here if it wasn't for leaders that God has put around us. We have enjoyed so much help, so much friendship, so much support, so much encouragement, so much standing together, and at times sending the reinforcements in, uh, knowing we're, we're not alone, and that's what happened. We guard our vision. One way we guard it is by reaching out to the leaders in our life. And let me just say, you need the elders in your life. You need the life group leaders, the small group leaders in your life. You need the ministry team leaders in your life. Kids, you need your parents that help guard your vision. We need those friends that are leading us, those disciplers. We need those people in our life. And we need to be, if we're serious about advancement for the kingdom, we need them. Number three. Verse 7 is kind of a gruesome verse in this. Uh, I thought, should I read it again? Yeah, I will. He took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of the message, saying, whoever does not come out with Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. It says, the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. The third point is this. If we're going to get serious about multiplication, making disciples, this, then we need to go out as one man, as a family of churches. Like there, there's, the enemy is defeated when we go out as one man. And when we're just Lifehouse Church and Jubilee and Living Way and Living Hope and Christian Assembly, when we're, when we're that and we're just doing our own things, we're subject to attack and we're actually subject to being taken out. But if we want to inflict like real uh, inroads into the kingdom of darkness, I think this is a, a story for us that we need to go out as one man. We're a family of churches. You'll hear that phrase, together on mission. That story would kind of be like this, that I was thinking about Saul cutting up. Like, what would that look like today? Like what would, what would cause the dread of the Lord to fall upon us all where we go out as one man today? Maybe Carl, uh, I don't know, 
cutting up our cell phones, like grabbing, grab, somehow he gets John Worstel and Ben to help him, and they chop into all our nice SUVs and our cars, so we have nothing, nothing to drive, and he takes our cell phones, and, he, and then he takes every, he gets, somehow he gets into our bank accounts, and he limits all that, and he says, I'll tell you what, if you don't come out, whoever doesn't stand with, uh, with, with Bryce and, and with Clark tonight, this is going to happen to you. <laughs> like, there's no SUV, there's no cell phone. And there's no bank account. And the Southeast said, the, fear, the dread of the Lord fell upon them all. And they went out as one man. But something needs to happen. So, something needs to happen to us that we understand God has enlisted us into a battle, that this life is short. We want to make a difference. That, and Americans are incredibly good at being independent and lone rangers. And God, I think, wants to do something and is doing something pretty incredible here. I think the offerings are testimony to that. But I think he has more for us in this, in this theme of multiplication. So we go out as one man. I'd like the band to come and... Uh, that means the worship team needs to come up here now. <laughs> Sometimes it's different at our church. <clears throat> what that means is when our leaders say something is important, we, we need to do it. We're, we need to be, we used to have this phrase uh, in youth camp. I don't know if they still have it because I'm not there anymore, but we used to have this phrase. Whatever we do, we do together, and whatever we do, we do with all our heart. Tommy Stanley, did you and Carl come up with that? I don't know who, I think you might have. But it was a, it's a great phrase. Whatever we do, we do together. And whatever we do, we do with all of our heart. And there was a purpose behind that. It's actually biblical. They went out as one man. Southeast, confluence. Whatever we do, we do together. Whatever we do, we do with all heart. We go out as one man. That means if our leaders say, hey, let's gather to pray. Guess what? We're going to gather to pray. Why? Because there's a battle taking place and we don't want to lose our vision and we want to push back the enemy and, and God's given us a big vision. We may not have anything else, but we've got a big vision. And we don't want the enemy to take that out. And I was thinking about this night specifically and praying into this. And I just felt there were some groups of people, and I'm going to highlight you. And I just want to ask this question as you're seated, and I'll ask you to raise your hand, and I want to give you a full, full uh, disclosure. We're going to have a time at the end where we actually pray, and we're near the end. So we're going to have a time in a moment where we pray. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, wants to meet with people. And there's a lot more to this story. But I just feel we need to stop. And actually, I, I believe there are people here. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Then after you raise your hand, I'm going to ask everyone is to stand. And then I'm going to ask you if you raise your hand to come forward. So now you know. All right, that's what's going to happen. But I have a question. I believe there are you surrounded by the enemy right now? Like, I believe there are people and you're not saying, no, I just, I just feel surrounded. No, I am, I am really surrounded. And you have vision. But you are also aware that there's an enemy that's wanting to take that vision away. And there's an enticement to maybe settle for something less than vision for the kingdom of God. That it's really enticing to think about some peace at this moment in time. Because there's real danger. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's finance. Maybe it's spiritual attacks. You know that it's real. I don't have to make it up. But that's you. I just wonder, if that's you, would you raise your hand tonight? Does anyone feels that? Raise it up so I can see. Real attacks. You can put it down. I believe there's another group tonight that... Uh, God really wants to speak to and as I believe it as that picture came up of that soldier it's like something leapt in your heart I believe there's a group that God wants to 
He really wants to grant vision to you. Like vision to see His kingdom advance. And, and in you, there's this desire that's rising up. And it's a desire like to, to not have the typical American life. It's a desire. Maybe you're a young couple and it's a desire. No, we don't want to settle for the nice house, two and a half kids, a nice SUV. We actually want our life to make a difference for the kingdom. And whatever that looks like, Lord, I want that vision. I want clear vision. And you just know that God's speaking to you. And if that's you tonight, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Yeah. I feel like there's a third group tonight and we want to pray because God, guess what? We have a God that restores sight to the blind. That's what He does. Like, that's not just a story. Like, the living Savior gives sight to the blind. But I think there's a third group. And if you're honest, the the desire for peace is really enticing to you. It's where I was. Like you have vision. You know you're called. You know your life isn't the Lord's. But you've endured battles. And you walk with a limp. You don't walk upright anymore. I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about spiritual condition. You have a limp. And you just have that enticement. But in this, in this word, you're sensing God wants... It's like almost like your vision is there, but it's clouded. It's becoming clouded. And I think God wants to give clear vision tonight. He wants to clear up that vision afresh this evening. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay. All right. Would you all stand? Don't make a treaty with the enemy. Don't do it. Mm. Reach out to leaders. Come on. Come on. Come upon us now. I just want to invite you if you raised your hand and we're going to spend time praying into this, praying for one another. Like that's one way we reach out to others. We yield to prayer. We do that. We're just going to see what God might do. Let him restore vision. So if you raised your hand, you'd like to, guess what? Even if you did, you can come forward. So let's spend some time as the band plays. If you raised your hand, you'd like to respond, but you come forward as we sing. We're going to pray. There's the ice cream. I love ice cream, but it can wait. Right? I mean, I'll be first there. Y'all stay here. I'll be right back. Uh, no, I, I, t- I promise you, I want to meet with God. Like, I need to meet with God. I want razor sharp vision. Like, I, I want this life to count. And we need the Holy Spirit. And I want you just now, if just yield, just even just your, like you're receiving a gift, just open your palms up. Just say, Lord, I need you. Holy Spirit, I want you. Lord, would you come do what you want to do right now? Lord, I just yield to you. And, and I lay down this idea of peace. I just lay it down. Lord, I lay it down. I've got an eternity of peace with you, God. I, I'm, I want this life to count. Come, Holy Spirit. I just want to ask leaders and others, and just if, if you just would just begin to pray and just say more, Lord, would you give them more? Like, Lord, those that have had their vision clouded, 
because of real pain and real wounds. I pray now, Holy Spirit, you would come as only you can do, Lord, and you would fan that flame. And Lord, you would burn bright and you would burn away the dross. And Lord, that we would see clearly what matters. Lord, that you would rekindle and re, you, Lord, you restore vision. Would you do that right now? And Lord, those that have responded say, I want my life to not be the typical American life. I'm, I'm a Christian first. American comes down the road, but I'm yours, Jesus. I'm yours. Lord, would you just see, I just feel like tonight there is like a planting of the flag. That I feel like, that, especially that group, it's like that coming forward. It's like tonight I'm planting a flag. My life is not going to settle for the typical American peaceful dream. My life is going to be the kings. And my business is going to be about the kings. Lord, would you do that by your spirit? Would you come, Lord? Let's just continue to meet with him. Continue to receive. Continue to pray with one another. Come, Holy Spirit.